Hello, my name is Professor John Benjamin, and this is West Virginia Wesleyan College, and this is Web Design. And today we'll be talking about web publishing fundamentals. So let's talk a little bit about the advantages of web publishing in, when compared to print publishing. So when we're talking about web publishing and its advantages, the words that we're going to use is currency, connectivity, interactivity, cost. I'll give you a little bit of history. Uh, back in the early 2000s, um, television and print were, were king. The web is very secondary, and um, people still weren't really taking it that seriously. But then uh, the recession hit in 2008 to 2012, and a lot of companies were trying to save costs. And one of the ways that they could do that is through digital publishing. So they had a website about how can I take advantage of this and not spend as much money on, on printing, printing publications. So magazines went digital, newspapers went digital, and a lot of people sort of moved entirely to completely digital marketing uh, away from uh, print marketing, like um, magazine ads and um, uh, direct mail, and things of that sort. Um, and then what also happened right around 2008 was the iPad and then the iPhone came out and became really dominant. So now we've got these computers that we carry around with us all the time. And so that's where, again, digital marketing really became uh, became king and, and, and superseded uh, print. All right, so the currency advantage. So the web has a much better currency advantage. Like the ability to update uh, web pages quickly and inexpensively, really at no cost. Uh, where in print, uh, it's very problematic. Like in, in my personal experience, um, I worked for associations that would have annual meetings. And so we would print out a brochure that had all of the uh, activities and the speakers that were going to happen at the meeting about three months ahead of time. And, uh, but what would happen inevitably is you'd have speakers would cancel, things would change, and the programming would be a lot different three months later. Now the great thing is then with the web, we can change that on the website, can on the brochure, we could change it on the PDF. Um, but then we could also send out a Facebook message or an email letting uh, attendees know that things have changed. So we've got that currency advantage which is pretty priceless data. Like news websites have constant updates on the stock market, on the weather, and things like that. Um, and uh, so there's this constant updating of information. Again, that currency advantage versus a printed newspaper, which is a day, you know, is really a day old news um, and uh, coming to your door. So again, we're getting that immediate updates. So that's a big advantage uh, with the news media particularly. The, another aspect of the connectivity advantage is the web's ability to immediately distribute and share content. So as things change, as they update, um, we can blast or give, give a push or send an email, all these different ways to let all the users uh, know this information almost immediately. So an immediate change has happened. So again, something you absolutely can't do with, um, with the printing. Now, one thing that should be mentioned though, um, when you do we have this connectivity advantage, but one thing that has happened is um, the quality of um, publications have decreased. Because when we're talking about print publications, there is a great expense, and you can't bring it back once it's out there. So in print publications, in, in still like in books and magazines and newspapers and um, uh, direct, direct mail, there is a long process that's very scrutinized um, the, that there's no spelling mistakes, that the information is all accurate. And there's a whole team of people that ensure that that happens. Now with the web, just one person can make that update and send it out in a Facebook post. So it doesn't, it's not vetted in the same way. So we do have a quite a large decrease um, in the quality of our information. Uh, interactivity advantage. Uh, the internet and the web technologies promote data and resource sharing. So there isn't exactly that same copyright issue. Like if I was to, you know, go and photocopy or reuse something from a newspaper or magazine. So the internet encourages sharing. They want more people to share out that, that magazine article. And so a lot of that is encouraged in social media and whatnot. Um, but there's all sorts of interactivity. So there's just multiple levels. Um, web-based forms, um, comments, uh, when you want to comment on a product, you can leave a comment on a Facebook page or respond to a Twitter feed. And so there's um, a whole host of interactivity where we feel as a user engaged um, with the, um, 
the magazine or the website or the company or organization, whoever it is, where that interactivity does not happen with printed media. Um, like for instance, here at Land's End, there's just so many ways that you can interact with Land's End. You can leave a comment, you can chat, you can send them an email, um, you can call, but they don't really want you to do that. You can sign up and become a member so then that you can get certain pushes and certain emails and certain um, um, promotions uh, and a lot of things like that. So all sorts of ways to interact. And so again, for your website to be successful, the more ways that you can increase interactivity, the better. Then there's the cost advantage. Now there is a high upfront cost with, um, with the web. So to build a really well built website can cost you know, $30,000. Um, so, but that once that upfront cost is paid, then everything else is inexpensive. So constantly publishing and updating and sending out information to your clients or your, your consumers, uh, your customers, um, is, is absolutely really little or no cost at all, where there's no big upfront cost to printing, but there's a steady, pretty heavy load because you have to constantly be printing and mailing postage and whatnot. <clears throat> Then there's the delivery advantage. Web delivery is direct and immediate, like we said, where printed works take time. It takes time to del get delivered. It takes time to produce. So there's a real delay. So this delivery advantage is really key. Um, one thing, though, that does work really well is the kind of things in, in marketing working in tandem. So there's the immediate message that's carried on by the web, but then there's a longer uh, message that might be, you know, printed, uh, maybe a billboard or direct mail. So used in combo. Okay, so let's talk about basic web design principles. Okay, how do we make our website appear uh, dignified, authoritative, um, and, um, and current? So people, it has trustworthiness. And so we're going to use these three basic principles which are broken down into two. So really there's six basic web design principles that we're going to use visual principles and visual communication to, um, to help convey a trustworthiness and, um, of our website. So when we first talk about uh, visual communication, it's important to talk a little bit about Gestalt. Gestalt psychology was pioneered at the beginning of the century by Max Wernheimer. And really what their, their science says is um, basically the, through their studies, they realized that the human brain, when it takes in visual information, it's constantly trying to organize it. And so it does this in, in, in several uh, ways. The first rule though, or step in, in Gestalt is simplicity. So when we see something that's simple, our brain immediately recognizes that it's not gonna require a lot of energy to decipher it. So simplicity is kind of the number one rule. Next is figure ground, always being um, conscious about what's in the foreground and what's in the background as, the, as the, our brain um, tries to organize things based on, on perspective. Uh, three is probably one of the more important ones. We'll talk a lot more about that, but proximity, the brain, when it sees things close together, it assumes that that's part of a group, so it's organizing that. Similarly, uh, common fate, where things that all look like they're pointing in the same direction seem to be part of a group. Similarity is a really key role. Similarity can use things like texture, color, um, and shape. And so if things have similar shape, similar color, similar texture, our brain will lump those and say they're part of a group. Like if you looked out at a parking lot and you saw red cars, you might be able to see them first and your brain would group them together. Um, symmetry and alignment. Anything that's aligned, that shares uh, a line, is seen as a group. And things that are symmetrical are seen as a group. Um, and then continuity and closure. Those are both related to um, how our mind fills in the gaps, if you will. So this is a better illustration that might help a little bit about that continuation or continuity. If something appears to, the, to keep on continuing, even though it's been obstructed, like a horizon line that's broken by trees, our brain will still recognize that that's a horizon line, that it's consistent. And closure is similar, where um, our brain will fill in a gap that's broken. If, if the line seems to be going in the same direction. So here we have similarity. Our brain will group things that are similar shape, texture, or color. And then figure ground, like what's the dominant color, light or dark, 
what's the foreground, what's the background. So this applies to the web design principles of balance and proximity. So balance is the harmonious arrangement of elements in a composition. You can have symmetrical or asymmetrical balance, and they both convey or connote um, different feelings. Symmetrical balance, where things are pretty much even on both sides, gives a sense of peace, centeredness, um, and sometimes authority. Uh, where asymmetry, a little off balance, and maybe something's weighted a little heavier than the other side, this gives a sense of energy and a more energetic uh, mood. And that's because that imbalance allows the eye this sort of freedom and it kind of creates movement. It is important to know that asymmetrical designs in the web don't apply themselves that well to um, RDW, RWD, Responsive Web Design Principles. So here's a great example of a little bit of both. And so I think here on the Whole Foods website, it's got a little bit of symmetry and asymmetry. This text here is symmetrical, it's centered. Um, this is a large image that's, that's centered, but we have this great asymmetrical balance that allows for movement. So the Whole Foods logo is quite large, draws our attention, it's a focal point, and so is this grocery delivery. They really want to draw our attention to this, so it's a big flat and it's simple. So because it's simple, it's quieter, we're drawn to this. And so this is a little bit more heavily weighted on the right uh, than the left, but then that allows the eye to sort of kind of move around and, and creates a little bit more movement. Proximity. Things that are close to each other are seen as a group. This is really important uh, in a website so we can facilitate the quick, easy scannability of a website. So how can people go and find the information that they're looking for really quickly? And we can do that with proximity. And white space enhances proximity. White space doesn't have to be white. We're just talking about the space that's between people. You can have a black background. We might still refer to that as white space. So here in Martha Stewart's website, there's a lot of space that creates grouping or proximity. So this is all grouped together here, not just because of this rule, but because there's ample white space above this group of information here. Same thing here and here, all of that white space allows for more contrasting uh, proximity. So we see that this is a group, we see that's a group, and that's a group. So contrast helps uh, create focal point. So if you have uh, a, a black circle on a white background, that contrast will help focus in on that black circle, or vice versa. And so contrast is different text styles can create contrast, text weights, different colors, and different sizes. All this can, be, can create contrast, which helps us to focus on one particular area of, uh, of a website. So here we have typographic contrast, and this is also something that we refer to in web design as chunking. And so here we have two flyers that have the same exact information on them. One we can read, and one we're going to walk away from and not read. This one has what we also refer to as hierarchy. So Maya Angelou is in an H1, uh, poetry reading is in an H3, H2, and then the Times in an H3, and then this information here is probably with a P tag if this were a website, and this is all the same. And so now we can extrapolate, we can scan and extrapolate in information quickly. So if you know Maya Angelou, you probably are familiar with her poetry, and so you're very excited, you're like, oh, that's something I'm interested in. If you don't know her, then you're not gonna be interested in this. And so you can quickly move on without reading the rest of the information. And so you can read that, and then go, what is it about Maya? Oh, there's a poetry reading, and like, oh, well, I wanna go. Next most important information is, well, can I make it in my schedule? Yes, I'm free that time. Where is it? Ah, oh, it's at the library. And then finally, can I find more information about it? So again, this is done with contrast, size contrast, weight contrast, and remember white space, white space and proximity. That allows us to group this information together. Here we have great examples of contrast and focus. So here we have a person holding a helmet and their colors are contrasting to this very quiet background. So this figure, this model is really popping out from here on HubSpot. I'm here with the Guardian using darks and lights. So we've got a lot of white space that draws us to their, their, the title, their masthead, and then to this photograph. And then the same down here, we have call to actions or CTAs. 
So great big red button here that's saying sign up for free. That's going to draw our attention and then watch demo, and then we might come back here and read this. So contrast allows us to focus in on, on where we want our users to go and what we want them to look at. Uh, here's another example of contrast using darks and lights um, and space as well to group information and to call attention to the most important parts of the website. But you can quickly scan through this and find your information because it's not like this poster, it's more like this one using contrast. Unity and visual identities, these go together. So a brand identity system is a set of rules for the visuals in any company, organization, or person um, that have a set of rules that they identify so they all appear to be part of the same group. And this is part of branding, um, creating a visual identity. Um, so one of the most important things is, is when you're on the home page and then you go to the secondary pages, that you still feel that continuity, that unity between the pages. The colors are the same, the typography is the same, the style of photography is the same. So when we're talking about unity and visual identity systems or brand identity systems, they have to be unified. Like I said, a set of rules. Typically that has to do with fonts or typefaces, I should say, color, and the type of imagery, the, the, the treatment of the photography and the graphics. So when we're talking about brand, it starts with the logo. That usually defines it. That establishes the color and the way the shapes and imagery is going to look. Is it going to be fun and playful? or serious, like a bank. And then after the logo come the identity assets. So that's the web page, that's the flyer, that's the, the letterhead and the business cards. Could be the uh, vehicle library and the signage. And so that's the visual aspect and it ends there. And that is not the entire brand experience. The whole brand experience is much larger than that. That's where we're talking about the actions of the company, the products they make, their reputation, customer expectations, how is their customer service, and how are their employees treated. So again, we're talking the visual aspect is really just a small corner of the brand, where a whole brand is, uh, includes much, much more. But when we're talking about the visual aspect of the website, we are talking about um, the logo and the visuals, the brand identity system. That has to be unified. Here's a great example of uh, Subway. Subway, um, again, keeps a simple color system two greens and a yellow, so a yellowish green. This is an analogous color system, so we've got some a warm yellow is right next to this yellow green on the color wheel, and then this green comes later, so it's a nice warm and analogous system. Um, it's carried throughout the website. We see the, web, the subway logo is repeated. The structure of the website is very similar, the, how they treat the space, uh, and everything sort of repeats, so it's very unified. Alignment is a great um, way to create unity as well. So when we're talking about RWD principles, responsive web design principles, we're talking about a 12-grid system and um, how each of the boxes and the groups of text are all put on that 12-column system to create uh, proximity and grouping. All right, so color is probably one of the most powerful web design tools. We have to be very, very careful and very thoughtful about how we choose our color. So color reinforces the brand. It can bring focus, like I talked about before. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but let's say, for instance, you wanted to bring focus on something, you might make it purple and give its complementary color as a background, which might be yellow. Um, it increases contrast, again, which brings focus. It improves readability. That comes with contrast as well, and then it sets the mood. Is it a fun, playful website? Is it a yoga website? Do I want to feel calm? Is it sort of like an aggressive gaming website, you know, with lots of intense, vibrant colors? So all of these are really important, connotatively important. So here's a great example, the NASA website. So it has its colors brand, which are navy blue, um, bright red, and then the gold color. And so here we use red and then the gold color here and here, and then the photograph of the Earth takes care of that blue. But this has great contrast and focus. So this white text and this bright red text really pop on the black background. And so even though it's smaller, it has more space around it. And so this is what I'm drawn to first, explore our data repository, watch our story, then I might come down and check out this is the Gene Lab. Here are two really excellent color tools. So it can be really daunting if you're not used to picking colors. So there's a couple of online tools that are free. Uh, color.adobe.com is really helpful, and that'll help you 
put colors together. What's working, what colors work together, and what schemes can you use? And the same thing with Pantone's Color Finder. Um, it's actually even probably a more powerful tool. And so when we're talking about color, there's lots of different aspects to color. I'm gonna give you four aspects of color, um, try to keep it simple, um, that we need to consider when we're choosing colors. First of all, primarily, of course, the color wheel. So we need to know what are the primary, secondary colors. And the color wheel also tells us um, warm colors and analogous colors. And so the primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. All the other colors on the wheel are just a mixture of those colors. Um, if we're talking about monitors, it's a green red RGB, red, green, and blue. Um, you know, green and, and, and yellow wavelengths are very, very similar. And those different intensities of those three colors make up all the colors in the spectrum. And the secondary colors are the mixture of the primary colors. Blue and yellow make green, yellow and red make orange, and blue and red make purple. And then you can see on the color wheel too, and here's the warmer colors, and here's the cooler colors. And that has a very important connotative resp emotional response. So how do we feel when we're cold versus warm? So that's a very important consideration when you're choosing your colors. Next is color harmony. How do colors interact with each other? And there's seven color harmony schemes. Um, the two big ones that you really want to focus on are analogous and complementary. So analogous colors always work really well. We saw Subway using these three colors almost precisely. Uh, they're analogous. They're all on the same side of the color wheel. Complementary colors, their goal is to help colors pop. So they're on opposite ends of the color wheel. So like I mentioned before, if you want something to really pop, you can make it yellow and have the background be purple because yellow is going to have the greatest contrast with purple. So is orange on blue, red on green, and vice versa. And you can flip those, a yellow background with a purple top. So that will really draw focus, it will really make it pop. Monochromatic is a really interesting one. Uh, when we're talking about color, it's where you pick one color, so mono, and then you, you add dark or light to it. You lighten it by tinting it, or you darken it by shading it. And that becomes a monochromatic color scheme. Then there's triadic and tetradic, a little more complicated. Uh, and then shades, or achromatic, which are muted colors. Now here's one that we don't think about too often. We might decide that we're using red for a particular reason. Um, you know, maybe our brand or our website has sort of an aggressive side to it, uh, more of a passionate side, so we're gonna use red. We've made that determination. But the colors that red sits upon or is next to change how we respond to that color and the, what that color communicates entirely. And you can see that really here. So again, red on a black background is very aggressive. Much more common a white background. Here, it's much more muted on another background that's analogous and has the same value. In other words, the same darkness or lightness uh, about it. And then here, on a bright blue background, it actually makes the color vibrate. So through four completely different reds, all the same red color, but now their, their context is changed, so their meaning is changed. And then lastly, color meaning. So color meaning can have cultural and some biological aspects. Uh, red we associate, like I mentioned, with passion. Part of that is if someone's angry, um, their blood rushes to their face. Their face might turn red. Um, or, for instance, a wolf, when we say is baring its teeth, it's actually showing uh, it, you, its gums. It's saying more blood is pumping to its face, and so therefore its gums get brighter. And that's a warning. That's a warning across nature. So roosters and cranes have blood sacs. Anywhere in nature where we see red, it's like a little bit of a warning. Um, yellow and orange are energy. We have a yellow sun, and so sunlight, bright light, releases serotonin, so that actually has a physical response to our body. So we associate orange and yellow with happiness and energy. Green is peace and harmony, um, you know, green leaves in nature. Uh, unless you don't like nature, again, considering your, your, your target audience, they might respond to green differently. These are some generalized um, color meanings. Blue is common melancholy. Now that also has a biological response. At the end of the day, the last wavelength of light you see is blue. And when you go to sleep or when the lights dim, melatonin is released, so you become sleepy. So therefore, common melancholy is associated with blue. Again, also red is a warm color, blue is a cool color. Purple, this is a more of a cultural one here when we talk about it representing dignity or royalty. And that's predominantly just in... Um, 
in, in Europe. And so in medieval Europe, purple was hard to come by, so just really uh, wealthy and royal people would be wearing it. Uh, brown is friendly, and black is powerful. And then here is um, an interesting one. Uh, white is a great cultural difference. White Western cultures can signify purity, and in Asian cultures it signifies death. So very important cultural difference there in that color. And on the web, we use the RGB color system, as I mentioned before. And so how that works is we have red, green, and blue, and we have 256 values of each of those colors. So if you multiply 255 times 255 times 255, you get 16 million colors. And that's where our hexadecimal system works. And it gives us a color code that's signified by the hashtag. Writing for the web, like I talked about again, the web has different affordances than a novel or a magazine, and the, what it does afford is, is quick, um, trying to get information quickly and succinctly, it's trying to scan it, find it, read it, and go to the next web page. So when we're writing for the web, it's a completely different style. It needs to be straightforward, it has to be contemporary, and it has to be geared towards an educated audience. So one of the things is when people are on the web, they will, they'll intuit different types of languages. So for instance, overly promotional language, you might not even realize it, but the, your average web audience does recognize intuitively that you're trying to sell something. So you have to be very, very careful about that. We intuitively recognize, is it up to date? Is this current? And that's really critical. Um, and then using headings to communicate content. So again, scannability. We want to be able to scan through the website and quickly pick up those that information that we're looking for. So we look for those headings. So if they're really clearly written and they have good contrast, we'll find the information quickly. If I've got to scan through a whole bunch of text, I'm probably just going to skip it and try to find my information elsewhere. And also be very cautious with humor. Humor is very targeted. It does not meet a broad audience. You have to be very careful. Really just, basically just try to avoid it. Again, we talk about accuracy and, and currency. So um, you always have to confirm the accuracy of your material. I mean, cite things. Um, your audience will, again, they'll just intuit that this is, you know, this is just hearsay versus an actual uh, cited material from a reputable source. Avoid spelling and grammar errors. This we have to be extra cautious about because, like I mentioned before, things aren't vetted as much as they were in printed material because it's so easy to post on a website or on social media. So we have to be a little extra careful, put that little extra effort into spelling and grammar checking. Um, again, I can't say it enough, content has to be current. And then always indicate the date and the time of your last update. So that way, the, your viewers immediately know this is current content. Um, scannability, like I mentioned, <clears throat> chunking the text, breaking it up, giving it lots of space around it, good clear headings, subheadings, and bullets. So here is a perfect example. This is fine for a magazine. This does not fly on the web. You take this same information, break it down, simplify it into a heading, a topic sentence, and bullets. So again, very different. The same information, but treated very differently. Like I mentioned, chunked text. And we use uh, really important, the topic sentence. You want the reader, especially in news, but really in any situation, the first sentence has to really summarize what they're about to read. If they want to read it or they want to continue, they're going to know right away. Yeah, avoid using uppercase. You can't read uppercase letters very well. And avoid using color or underline text for emphasis because an underline is a signal that it's a hyperlink. And so you really want to avoid that at all costs. And so the tactic that we use is called the inverted pyramid. When you're writing for the web, you summarize first a very clear title a very clear summarized topic sentence, then give us some bulleted details, and then you can go into the longer background information. So here's a great example here on CNN for Money. So Microsoft goes after Apple using a sleek service desk desktop. Here we've got the time it was last updated, so we know it's current. And then this topic sentence gives us a little more information. Microsoft aims to lure designers away from Apple with its new service desktop computer. And now we can go deeper into the background information now that I know, know what I'm looking for here. All right, and then finally, we're going to talk about some legal issues with the web. So first of all, um, technical issues, bandwidth. So we have to be conscious 
when we're thinking about our target audience, what's their bandwidth? So we always want to keep all of our sites as light as possible. So we use thumbnail images because there's less data there. That way, if a person's, say, in a rural area, they don't have good cell coverage, they, then that, that web page will load very quickly. And then if they want a bigger image, they can click on the thumbnail. Um, we also always want to be mindful about browser differences and always do lots of tests on different browsers before we publish. Um, resolution. Again, our, is our audience predominantly for the phone? We always want to gear for the phone first, um, but then what we have is we use media queries to distinguish between the phone and the desktop. So we can have high res on the desktop, but then the computer will recognize the phone and show a low res. And so what we call that is mobile first. We always want to design for the phone first. The phone should look the best, and then you can make changes sort of to adapt your website to a desktop or a laptop. But the phone is always going to be the, your primary focus of, of where your design is going to go. All right, let's talk about some legal issues. Ownership of intellectual property, getting permission. Um, this is, we'll talk about image rights first. So we have a lot of terms here that people use interchangeably, and they definitely are not. Copyright, Creative Commons, Creative Commons Zero, royalty-free, rights-managed, and fair use. So copyright, it's important to remember that any literary, written, dramatic, artistic work um, is immediately copyrighted. It's immediately protected under the law. If you doodle on your notepad, that's a piece of artwork that you created. If you put it on the internet, people cannot take that. You own it and your, that ownership is protected under the law. Now, what is Creative Commons? So because that law is so strict, Creative Commons uh, gives artists an opportunity to share their work for free under specific guidelines. So you can have Creative, Com Creative Commons Zero license on your imagery, and that means that you're telling anyone they can use it for any purpose they want with no attribution, and they can even change or alter your imagery. And this may be something that you want. You, you're an artist, you wanna, you're a designer, you want to share your work. Um, also, maybe you want to drive traffic to your website by providing things for free. There's lots of different reasons um, that you might want to have a CC0. But regular Creative Commons licenses um, have different subcategories as well. So some might say, you can use my image, um, but I, it needs to have an attribution. You don't have to ask me. You don't need permission. But it has to have an attribution, and that's the buy. Um, there's others that you say you can use, like NC. You can use it in any way you want, but you cannot profit from it. It can't be used in commercial purposes. Um, and then others uh, where you can alter or not alter the image. So that's incredibly different from royalty-free. Royalty-free does not mean it's free and you can use it anytime you want. Royalty-free applies to stock image websites where you buy the image and then you can use it in any way you want. You purchased it. You no longer have to pay royalties every time you use it. And so that's like Adobe stock or Shutterstock or iStock. That is, does not mean you can use it for free. Now, this is important to differentiate this from rights managed. Now, Getty and Alami uh, and Media Bakery are all fall into this category. So this is very important. Important Rights managed means you only purchase the photograph or the image for a very specific use. So, for instance, my an image I use for a brochure that's only going to have 100 copies is going to be a very small fee. And that's the only place I'm allowed to use it by contract. Now, if I wanted to use that same image on the front page of my website that can be seen by a million visitors, that's going to have a very different price tag. So that's what rights management means. It's you sign contracts based on exactly how you're going to use the image and for how long. Then finally, there's the Fair Use Act, or the Fair Use Doctrine. And this allows a little more flexibility within copyright. So there are certain circumstances, particularly like education, the classroom, scholarship, and research, where you can use, um, or also news reporting, commenting, and criticism. You can use imagery on your blog or in your newspaper without permission. Um, you still have to give attribution, but you don't, don't need permission because you're using it for educational purposes or to inform the public. And so where this gets a little fuzzy is with blogs. So you can use an image without permission but with attribution um, from a different source, <clears throat> as long as it helps facilitate informing the public about what you're talking about. If you're using an image that just to help make it, your blog post look a little better or pretty it up or draw attention to it, 
then that's not fair use, and that's where we get into trouble. All right, so in addition to um, copyright issues, we have privacy issues. So this is where we use a lot of specialty encryption and decryption software to make sure that personal PII or personal identif identifiable information is protected. And so if you're going to collect um, any uh, PII information, you want to make sure that you've got a really excellent encryption system. And then lastly, and most importantly, are web accessibility issues. So the W3C sets the standards for uh, WAI, the Web Accessibility Initiative. And so this is a set of standards uh, from Section 508 that deal with um, how to make the web accessible to people with disabilities. Predominantly uh, is regarding people with visual impairments. And so one of the simplest ways that we can um, facilitate this is to use good alt tags that are very descriptive. So for the visually impaired that are using uh, screen readers that read things aloud, there's a description of the image uh, that they can't see very well. All right, so that's all I have today. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.